Do arsonists feel that powerlessness, that, that, that desire to strike back some way, the only way that's possible for them? Just don't know how to, how to make their, have their revenge? And I guess that's why the image of the arsonist appealed to me. It was somebody who, for some reason, I didn't even understand why, wanted to set fire to the, to the tankers around the BHP and blow it up. And I thought, yeah, I can understand that. The image that I remember most about the time when I used to burn things was a whole road where I grew up really long road. Uh, I lit it up all the bins along the side of the road. And when I got to the end of the road, I looked up up along the road and it looked like a, like an airstrip. Sort of uh, had bins on either side all lit up. And it just, I know it looked really good to me. I don't know, I don't know really why. And It's a funny thing because you're sort of destroying something through fire, but you're creating an environment as well. I started, I started burning things. I was drunk walking home, <laughs> walking home to a friend's place. And um, there was just a pile of garbage out front of a house. And so I just lit it up. I don't, like, I didn't feel any compulsion to light it or anything like that. I just lit it and walked on down the street. And when I got to the corner, I turned around and just, it was up in flames. Like, it was quite a, quite a big fire. It wasn't really near anything, so there was no danger or anything like that. But, um, yeah, it just, it felt, it felt good. <laughs> so over the next six months, I started to light rubbish. Um, people's bins, public bins, more and more. And I didn't know when it was going to stop, so I was getting a bit worried about it. I didn't want to get caught. And I was quite clever, because um, it was like a procession. It was like sort of where I'd been on my way back to these friends' place. And by the time I'd sort of got near their place, I'd either divert the procession along another road or I'd just stop, you know, just before I got there and sometimes look back or just go inside and I never told anyone about it for a long time. Like, I even forgot about it. About 10 years or so, I started, I don't know, I just mentioned it to someone at a party once and just remembered that I used to do it. The way I got out of it was I lit this tree once, which was sort of the only thing that I lit, which was um, organic. Uh, all the other stuff I lit was just rubbish. And it was one of those trees with um, thin, thin papery bark. So it was really easy to light and it went up really, really easy. And by the time it reached the top of the tree, it was all sort of thin twigs and things like that. And it just went up and I was walking down the road, just kept looking back at it sort of admiring it in a way. Anyway, this other guy got the blame for it. Apparently he'd been lighting fires in another part of town. And uh, yeah, he, he got caught somehow. I'm not sure how he got caught, but yeah, he got blamed for the tree that I lit up. And he confessed to that, lighting that tree and all these other fires that he lit. This guy had been burning fires, I think a lot longer than I had been. He'd been doing it over a number of years. I think even some of the fires that I lit he were attributed to, to, to him. He was doing a similar act and I didn't really feel any affinity with him because I don't know the reasons why he was doing that. I mean, you never hear those stories like why people do it really. Or, you know, someone else tells, tells the media which tells you why they do it, but you never really get a, a confession or a, an expose or some sort of story on why the guy did it. It's just, you know, a, a couple of paragraphs in a newspaper. Someone had been lighting fires. This guy was also snow dropping and he was a fireman. And he got caught and that was it. You know, you didn't hear about it anymore after that.
When I was a teenager, I used to come up here with some friends of mine, and it was a great spot here by the cathedral to get a good view of the steelworks, because the steelworks is right over here, and the flames used to come out of the blast furnace and light up the night sky. Fantastic fireworks display, great billowing clouds of smoke. It was here that I first got the idea of the fiery beast trapped inside the blast furnace. And many years later, I came to use that image in my play, which represented in many ways a feeling of, of constriction, of, of awesome power being contained within the blast furnace, something that I, I really wanted to free, to liberate it. We meet from time to time, but yeah. uh, this occasion of uh, uh, hearing about the arsonist is, is very interesting to me because, yeah. of course, I remember all those years ago when you were a student in Newcastle yeah. and uh, we had Max Frisch's Biedermann und die Brandstifter, the, yeah. the fire raiser. Yeah. And I have heard you talking about Frisch in the meantime and I've mm. been interested to know mm. uh, what sort of effect that play had on you. The uh, fire raisers, it was more a, a psychological study of what made Mr. Biedermann, Mr. Everyman, tolerate these firebug fiends in the in the roof yeah you know yeah. it wasn't just a straight political analysis no it was more sociological though wasn't it about yeah you know Frisch was interested in attacking the uh, what the the, the uh, self-absorption of the Swiss yeah. and the fact that yeah. they yeah. couldn't see anything rotten in their society yeah at all. well because the uh, the three main characters in your play uh, Sid and Sparrow yeah. and, uh, and Johnny, yeah. they're all in a way involved in this arson business because mm. although Johnny is obviously the arsonist in yeah. the play, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sparrow in fact lights the fire yeah. That's right. <laughs> and Sid being a fireman, he clearly has those, uh, he's, he's got that potential to be an arsonist himself. That's right. I think. My father used to work for the electrical supply company that delivered the power to the steelwork. He had a lot of responsibility, my dad. Yeah. Responsibility for the safety of whole gangs of men working under him. Really dangerous conditions. High voltage power mains. Very stressful and he ended up with ulcers and depression. How can you deal with the fact that men are sick and stressed and and suffering as a result of their, their work is the dark side of the whole, the whole industrial town. What I felt more than anything was a feeling of powerlessness, not being able to fight back, not being able to do anything about this, just sitting there helplessly watching it. And somehow the, the character in the play gave me an outlet for that, get out there and set fires and wreak a trail of revenge. So in lots of ways he was acting, acting out my inner darker wishes. Somehow doing it through a play gave me the chance to express the things that I, I, I couldn't express any other way. So this this song, London Burning and Light My Fire are all in the... Yeah, yeah, all in the play, yeah. And Arthur Brown's in it as well. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> David Byrne and the Talking Heads. Hi, hello, the name of the show you've just tuned into on Triple R. Roger Taylor with you. Crane Theatre is going to be the site of Australia Arna in the coming month because on the 1st of March, uh, an Australian play has its premiere. Not only its American premiere, but its world premiere. At the Crane Theatre, it's put on by Dark Shelter Productions. Pretty excited, Phil, I guess, having your play, The Arsonist, world premiering in New York City. Yeah, Roger. Uh, pretty hard to believe, really, basically. The arsonist, though, it's set in Australia? I don't really name the cities, but it's, it's, it's got a history in Newcastle. I basically call it a steel city, a steel, steelworks-based city. And then it moves on to another unnamed capital city, which in my mind is actually Sydney. People who see the play in New York City will realise that it has an Australian setting, or is it a little bit more universal than that? Well, the the... The Australian setting really will come purely out of its character. The, I don't mention any names at all. It's just that it, I've insisted on it retaining this Australian flavour the whole way through. Given you know, your, your classic picture of the arsonist, uh, perhaps um, 
uh, psychosexually motivated or whatever. I mean, we read about these stories sure. of people who are in the country fire brigades who go out and start the fire and then Absolutely. get their kicks watching their mates uh, try and put it out. I guess, to be honest, when you write something like this, you have to look right within yourself and find what fascinates me with this topic. And it's, it, that's the confronting part. You're confronting the dark side of your own nature and, and saying, well, gee, I always do, did love fires. You know, I always was the first one on board when there'd be a local fire and I'd be fascinated. And so I've, brought a, I've looked deep into my own character and brought a little bit of that to flesh out the bones of this character. Because, uh, and to add to that, I've done quite a bit of research with reading up on arsonists, newspaper articles, etc. And you do come up with a pretty classical picture of somebody who does get their highs from starting a fire. And I have included a sexual element in it as well. He's basically got this obsession with Red, who's the, who's the redhead girl off the matchbox, who I always love myself. <laughs> So this is a little bit of the autobiographical coming well, through. That's isn't right. It, yeah? The old Bryant and May redhead girls. I mean, who hasn't had an affair with uh, one of those? With one of those beautiful ladies. Yeah. And I feature a couple of those on the wall in Johnny's room in the play. And I've also collected headliners, what they call the headliners, out the front of news agencies, with massive, big, maximum size print saying things like "Hotel Blaze Terror." Joining us on the line from New York City, Morgan Dowsett, the director of The Arsonist. When I read it the first time, the first thing that popped into my mind was uh, was Max Frisch's uh, Herr Biederman and the Firebugs, a morality play without a moral. It's, uh, it's a Swiss German play uh, based in the 30s. It was heavily influenced by Brecht, so it's an extremely political play. The actors themselves, I am pushing to have them do Australian accents. Okay, so you didn't get that, you didn't get Australians to play the parts. No, no. Phil, did you write the play as a political play, or did you write it more just as a drama, you know, a, a, what we've talked about, a sort of a psycho yeah. uh, drama? So what I did basically was take the Frisch basic tale, which is about an arsonist who gets two arsonists actually who are camped upstairs in a house, and this guy refuses to acknowledge that they're present. It's an allegory about the Nazi presence in Germany. I read this article in the Newcastle Morning Herald about a kid who was trying to light a grass fire around the petrol tanks here, these huge petrol tanks with millions of litres of petrol in them. And at the time, the fire chief reckoned that if it, had, if it succeeded, he would have blown the tanks into outer space. Funny thing about it, at the same time as being repulsed by the idea, I found something really attractive in it as well. In terms of deliberate fire lighting, you can distinguish between the arsonist, who's a person who lights the fire deliberately, but they're doing it for reward. Either revenge against somebody, they're doing it because they're paid, um, versus a person who's a pyromaniac who's doing it for no reward other than an intrinsic one, that they have an increasing urge to light fires, that urge develops and their tension inside them increases and the lighting of the fire is a way of reducing that tension. When I first came on, urban renewal in Yonkers, and in where I, I, let me speak about where I come from, um, was considered a match. And one of the first challenges that a firefighter has to overcome is the ability to handle that type of pressure. See, our pressure starts long before that fire alarm rings. Unlike the old day to where um, we may have had a lot of smokers or whatever else and stuff, the whole department itself, the, the thinking of this job now has changed. Um, we are starting to get into more stay in peak top shape so that we can do the job that we're supposed to be doing and especially watch each other's back. And the worst thing that possibly could happen to us as professionals or whatever else and stuff is to be called out to a, or any type of fire but especially an arsonist fire because we put our lives on the line for you and they just they, they have no consideration whatsoever for human life, especially ours. I think one of the biggest challenges facing any fire department is to keep trained professionals 
at a minimum staffing. You know, um, it's nice to have a volunteer department or whatever else and stuff, but time means everything in a fire. The response time, the, the time that a fireman and apparatus can show up with the right personnel means literally the difference between life and death for the occupants of that particular dwelling. I've been injured countless times. Um, I've went through, through two floors, um, minor burns all over. Um, fire always gets down in the back of your, at least in the old days, um, in the back of your coats and everything else. Uh, uh, recently, um, I've had certain tragedies happen to where I came to the aid of a fallen firefighter who had to jump out of a back door, a, a back uh, apartment window, two floors. And when you look eye to eye with death, I looked him in the eye and the fear and I've seen this uh, uh, before, I mean, I have military experience, but it is just a reminder of what we do is for real. totally wrong for the part. He was too big yeah. and he was too physical. Like Sparrow, as we've said, yeah. mm -hmm. has to be this sort of demented little man. Yeah, and, little right, so now I have to go back to my friends again, go through all these eight by tens again and all like this. And that was how I found John. Mm -hmm. And John came uh, like one night and, you know, once again, I, I visualise characters mm -hmm. and especially with this play, because I've been with this play for so long now. Mm -hmm. When I saw Sparrow come up the street, I just mm -hmm. said to Morgan, there's Sparrow. Yeah, I'm Chris Manane. I just gave here for a year holiday and a net, and I'm helping Neil out with his play at the moment. I'm from, uh, from Moama, and uh, I'm over here doing a bit of work, and we're just helping uh, construct the, the, um, the stage tonight. So we're just about to head down there now in the van and get things done. I'm Alan Ogden, and um, I'm basically just giving Chris a hand um, on the set. Just doing a few things. We're just moving a bit of furniture now towards the theatre and um, making sure it's all packed in nice and safe, otherwise, Pete might get a bit uh, stroppy. Uh, he's a little bit tense at the moment, but he's alright. He's, he's always good fun. Yeah, he's, he's, you know. We just hope that the play goes really well and um, has a lot of enjoyment and success out of it. John Sutton made that Pete. He's from Echuca. Um Chris and I brought it over when when we came over about five months ago. So, um, Neil basically... in the border inn. Yeah, he drinks in the, in the border inn, the famous border inn in Moama. It's getting there. It's getting there. Philip's giving a talk to the actors now, so... Yeah. That'll be fun. Salvation Jane is a... She comes from another, that, that old order of... Here's the religious certainty, you know? It's, it's all certain. <clears throat> Just that nobody else can believe in it anymore. But uh, strangely enough, she's got this prophecy of the torching at the end, the judgment at the end. She prophesizes the avenging angel, Johnny, who's going to come and torch the whole lot and so that a new thing can come out of the, of the whole system. That's about it. Break a leg, guys. Okay. So if you have a bad pre-dress, uh, you have a good show, well, let's hope we have a good show. We have really bad pre-dress. Oh, it was very moving, very moving. Seeing that, some of that stuff for the first time, you know, it was amazing, really moving me inside, big. Yeah. Okay, there's, yeah, there's all the glitches at the end and stuff, and, and it's, uh, it was a, a jagged performance, but uh, for me, the ingredients are there. I just found out from the theatre owner, I would have liked to have used the fog machine for the ending and 
and uh, I just can't do it. And uh, the actors that's was going to be in it, it's like he just doesn't have the, the finesse to be careful. If we have it backstage, that joint will burn in two minutes. God, it sounded so Irish. When I was listening to the play, I kept thinking, Jesus Christ, this is this is Eugene O'Neill all over again, you know? I mean, don't put me in that category, please, I'm not being... But I couldn't help but seeing all that Irishness spilling back at me, you know? When we do the balloon, stay completely still. Like, freeze. It looks actually really good. Freeze. It does look great. Yeah. Now, uh, you, you oh, told us about the first blue that. light, you know, before the jack scene. So we didn't show up for it. Yeah, I know. But, but we, I forgot about the second radio No, but it worked well. It's just it's one of those mistakes that's all right. <laughs> Two things to Morgan at the end. I mean, he was pretty freaked out after the, after the run-through because it was, um, you know, the timing was off and it was slow and all the rest of it. But um, I just said I disagree with the blackout at the end. We, once uh, Sid's lying there on the ground, we want to see the carnage. We want to see the destru destruction. OK, it's in the half light, but we want to see it. Right now, oh, the show's bad. But, you know, well, it'll pick up, so... Uh, <laughs> can't get any worse than what it is, so hopefully it's going to pick up. But... but. The day of judgment will come, brothers and sisters, where heaven and earth shall quake and the Lord will come to judge the world by fire. I came over on a working visa and I've spent the last couple of years back and forth. Um, and so I was pretty lucky I saw the ad for this play in backstage and I went, well, I have to audition for that. I don't really know where I live at the moment. I wake up and I have to think about what country and what city I'm in. But um, I love New York. New York is fabulous. I know you got some McCausland's in Australia because one of them wrote the screenplay for the first Mad Max movie. So I assume you've got some down there. It's a good name, McCausland, you know. <laughs> and uh, part of the Buchanan clan. I went to work at Bethlehem Steel when I was 17, and I worked there for 23 years. Um, and then um, they shut the place down and I lost my job. And I had been doing some community theatre acting and I was really having a good time, so I thought when I lost my job I would try to do it professionally. So um, I went to college at the ripe old age of 40 and to Ithaca College and um, studied acting there for four years. Now I, another thing I'd like to say is I'm probably the only actor on this level in the United States, that is somebody who's acting and not making millions a year, who's a big George Bush fan. He is my man, George W. Bush is. And uh, why did I vote for him, somebody asked me once. I did it for spite, despite all the other people I know who voted against him. No, actually, I voted for him because I liked him. And all I can say is about you people who say Bush is an idiot, keep on, keep on underestimating him and he'll get reelected. Uh, he's a lot sharper than people think. It's been a real cultural experience for me, too, meeting so many people from Australia and um, one from South Africa. Yeah, I'm actually 24 years old, born in South Africa, born and raised over here in New York, pursuing a career of acting. Yeah, well, we, you know, I just found out we can't use the, uh, the scene. He has a scene where he lights a match in an ashtray and he burns the, uh, the book of matches. And I just found out from the owner we can't use that. Emily, no. Under 99 seat theatre, you can't have a live match on stage. You could probably get away with it, but the guy that has to do it, he's just like, he will burn the joint if he gets out of control with it. I know that's, a, that's not too good, but well, you just have to go through that. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I've got oh, 36 odd hours to get it right, I guess. So. Such is theatre, isn't it? Just when you think you got something licked, you get a damn new problem. Think of it. Think of it as literally a real spotlight. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. when you when you decide you want to rile up people, you know you can always be like come, trying to come back into the spotlight. Okay. In other words, don't worry about the theatrics of it. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck with the realism. We're gonna have to like the light looks fucking shit. It, you know, it, it, it's weak. The light needs to be stronger. I think uh, you know me better than that already. Yeah, forget about it, sir. That's my boy. Now, what you need is a good solid ball of brekkie in you. Come on in, cool. here, Oh, the accents are kind of, uh, you know, it's pretty American, but that doesn't bother me. It really doesn't bother me. 
it's 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 the feeling that, that that's so much stronger that, that it just swamps anything to do with accents. It's not a problem. Hey, I'm not like you know worried with uh, like so much the accents. Uh, it's you know like they're in and out on them and all like that. And you know they're like you know it's what is it? It's twelve o'clock in the morning here. It's a weird time to be active, you know. But especially when they were here last night. But um, well, that's just the way it is. But, uh, I, yeah, I said it's all right. <laughs> this is the fun part. The house will be open, so now just try and keep, you know, talk, you know, obviously talk, but just keep it low, just keep it low. So the house will be open at, at 7.45, the house will be open. seemed too much fire between the characters and we lost Australia in, in the process and somehow I think uh, that uh, uh, I couldn't figure out why this hotel owner was so uh, taken with this guy and the subtext of all that didn't really come through in their performances so it's just too broad for the subtlety of the writing I think. Nine years have passed since we had our big adventure in New York. And uh, a lot of things have happened in that time. The first thing uh, I reflect on is that the very year that we had the play in Manhattan was the, the year that 9-11 uh, occurred. The play actually was produced in the shadow of the Twin Towers. And that, that really struck pretty hard just to, to be aware of the closeness and the enormity of that experience. And um, we saw a lot of fire, fire fighters over in New York when we were there and it was just, it was tough to reflect on how many of them passed away. And we've also had out here, not very far from where I live, we've had the uh, Black Saturday fires and once again there's the, there's the horror of that of, of, of the of fire unleashed and, and, and doing its, wreaking its damage. 
And of course, there's the uh, outrage in the community about arsonists who are implicated in that uh, Black Saturday. So um, you, know, you really do you do reflect on 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 the carnage that comes from that kind of activity, and and yet uh, I'd like to say something about that. That um, I still think that that really brings home to us the the importance of looking into the soul of these people who are, who are caught up in, 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 in arson and say, why does it happen? What, what's brought them to this point? And, and if we don't look into it, well, we're never going to know. And I, I reckon it's the role of art and writing to, to, to really explore some of these issues. And if we're really fair income, the first thing we have to explore is our own, our own inner, inner self. One thing I've noticed since I've been back in Australia, I've got a property up in uh, northern Victoria and uh, I once was driving by and a uh, country rural road and I saw it obviously was, looked like a pretty nice looking car but it was completely burnt and my first reaction was, uh, you know, I hope no one was injured in this car and um, I then since spoke to a policeman and he was telling me that in the last 18 months to two years, this has become an incredible rural phenomenon where people, well, especially young kids, they'll joyride in a car and then I guess instead of, all right, we've had our joyride, now we'll just get out and walk to wherever we have to go, is they set fire to the car. And I, I, I don't know, I just found that to be... All right, I always thought the thrill of joyriding was, all right, let's go for a joyride. But now they've taken it to a new level of, uh, well, no, let's just burn this car.